I don't like driving. I'd much rather take the train or a bus or ride a bicycle or just plain walk than drive a car. This makes me a pretty bad American, I know. But even if I'm walking somewhere, I'm still depending on the internal combustion engine to get there. The sidewalk beneath my feet was put there by a cement mixer powered by an internal combustion engine. The buildings I walk past were constructed using combustion-powered machines. If I walk into the grocery store, the produce was brought there by a truck with, yes, an internal combustion engine. And some of the greatest environmental problems we've had to face are due to the internal combustion engine. Arguably, no single invention has had more influence over our civilization and our planet. But now, it might be on its way out. Car manufacturers and entire nations are phasing out the internal combustion engine and making way for newer, greener power sources, like batteries. So the end of the internal combustion engine might not be too far away, but its story begins a thousand years ago. The first device that could be described as an internal combustion engine was just a hollow piece of bamboo. Some enterprising and daring Chinese alchemist filled this bamboo with a mixture of ground-up sulfur, charcoal, and potassium nitrate. In other words, gunpowder. They topped it off with a small spear and ignited it. This caused an explosion that sent the spear flying out the end of the bamboo tube. That makes the first rudimentary internal combustion engine also the first gun. These two inventions both of which would go on to reshape the world, share a common origin. 600 years later, the earliest design for a more recognizable internal combustion engine still used gunpowder as fuel. The bamboo tube had been replaced by a cannon, and the spear was now a piston. 17th century polymaths Samuel Moreland and Christian Huygens both worked on these hypothetical gunpowder engines to pump water and children, apparently. But there's little evidence that a successful working model was ever built. After that, the internal combustion engine made a number of reappearances in a wide variety of forms. It dabbled with various types of fuel, hydrogen, coal dust, petroleum, and even turpentine. Dozens of engineers and crackpots and businessmen took a shot at the internal combustion engine, each one making an adjustment here, a breakthrough there, each advancement inching the engine closer to realization, but never quite allowing it to rise above the status of scientific experiment. That is, until the late 19th century, when it was attached to a handcart, allowing it to move under its own power. This was essentially the first car. The internal combustion engine had finally found its true calling, transportation. Soon, a car equipped with an internal combustion engine could easily beat out even the fastest, strongest animal. Carriages discarded their horses, and plows dumped their oxen. It allowed us to travel faster and farther. We could build bigger and higher, and made war a thousandfold more destructive, but it also connected us like never before. The streets and roads and highways that connect all major cities were built for automobiles powered by internal combustion engines, and built by machines with those same engines. Oranges grown in California could be shipped to New York in under a day, all year long. The internal combustion engine finally gave us the power necessary to make a true flying machine. Now jet engines have reduced the travel time to anywhere in the world to a matter of hours. In 1957, a highly modified internal combustion engine put the first satellite in orbit. Another one put us on the moon in 1969. In just over a century, the internal combustion engine not only reshaped the entire world, it made it smaller and gave us the beginnings of a truly global civilization. Even if it disappeared tomorrow, the impact the internal combustion engine has had on the world will linger long after it's gone. And its most enduring legacy might be the carbon left in our atmosphere. For decades, we've used these engines to convert liquid hydrocarbons into carbon dioxide. What took plants and microscopic algae millions of years to remove from the atmosphere, these engines have spewed back in the blink of a geologic eye. That extra carbon will be there for more than a lifetime, and the changes will last generations. Batteries are poised to take over much of the internal combustion engine's workload. Smaller, lighter, and most importantly, cleaner. They can do almost everything an internal combustion engine can do, so the transition to battery power should be mostly seamless. There will still be cars, and they won't look much different. The produce will still get to the grocery store, and there will still be buildings being built and sidewalks being walked upon. Getting rid of the internal combustion engine would seem to have no drawbacks. And since it is largely invisible as it is, its disappearance could come without anybody noticing much of a change at all. Of course, not all combustion engines will go away. We'll still hear the drone of passenger jets overhead and experience the spectacle of a rocket launch. But the roar of an internal combustion engine won't be the constant backdrop we hear today. For better or worse, the world will be left a quieter place, 
when the internal combustion engine finally goes. So when future generations look back on this brief time when these engines powered the world, maybe they'll look at it like we look at those cylinders full of gunpowder. Just another experiment, never fully realized. So, almost all the energy on Earth comes from the sun. Even the energy in the gasoline in your car comes from the sun. That's because the gas used to be crude oil, which used to be living plants that absorbed the energy of the sun. That's why it makes such a good power source for our internal combustion engines. But just how good is it, given the amount of sunlight used? And when will we run out of it? But since we don't have an infinite amount of time to continue explaining, the best way for you to learn is to do it yourself at brilliant.org. Brilliant is a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like a scientist by guiding you through problems. Brilliant shows you how to take a question, break it up into several mini-problems, think through these parts in a clear, thought-provoking manner, and then build back up to an interesting conclusion. Head on over to brilliant.org slash the good stuff and check out their Physics of the Everyday course. In it, they have a section called Fuel the World, where you can answer these questions yourself. As a bonus, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So have fun thinking like a scientist, and thanks for watching.